everybody back to the next session of our CLG training workshop. My name is John Wood with the North Carolina State Preservation Office. I'm a restoration specialist uh, based in the regional field office in Greenville. And due to the number of increased catastrophic flooding events that we're seeing in the state and the need to address disaster response, recovery, and resiliency, I want to discuss today uh, the elevation of historic buildings as we're seeing that that's being proposed more and more frequently as we have to deal with these storms. One note of housekeeping uh, before we get going, in the event of a water emergency, your seat cushions can be used as a flotation device. I want to preface my remarks today by saying that uh, we at the State Preservation Office don't currently have all the answers, although we hope to at some point. We're currently in the process of developing guidance for the elevation of historic buildings and hope to have that uh, out and available to everybody sometime early next year. So my discussion today will be through the lens of adapting historic buildings to flooding and sea level rise while making every effort to preserve the historic and character and integrity of the buildings and districts and also protecting the lives and personal property of the property owners within. And that's really a very difficult balancing act. Um, as, as such, many of the strategies that I'm going to talk about today uh, are pretty conservative and lean towards the preservation end of the spectrum. Now, in developing strategies to address flooding, each property must be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And those successful strategies must be tailored to the unique architecture, layout, topography, and character of your community. There's no such thing as boilerplate or one-size-fits-all in this game. And that's the disclaimer portion of the building. So here you can see some of the things that we're dealing with. This is a property in Little Washington that uh, has had some flood and it's currently in the process of being elevated. So again, no boilerplate, one, no one size fits all. And uh, people really love stories, especially us history-minded folks. So what I wanted to start out today with is to tell you a story. And this is a story about a little port city on an island whose highest point was 8.7 feet above sea level. Uh, the year is 1900, and Galveston, Texas was a bustling city of nearly 38,000 people. The city's position on the natural harbor of Galveston Bay along the Gulf of Mexico made it the center of trade in Texas and one of the busiest ports in the nation. The city was the fourth largest municipality in terms of population in the state of Texas at the time and had among the highest per capita income rates in the country. And at that time it was known as the Wall Street of the Southwest. Then one day in September, September 9, 1900 to be exact, an ill wind changed the course of history in the little city. The Great Galveston Hurricane made landfall south of Houston as a Category 4 hurricane with maximum sustained winds of 145 miles per hour. While crossing Galveston Island, the eye passed southwest of the city of Galveston. In addition to the winds, the hurricane brought with it a storm surge of over 15 feet that washed over the entire island. The Great Storm of 1900 was the deadliest natural disaster in the United States at that time and even in history today. It destroyed about 7,000 buildings of all uses in Galveston, which included slightly more than 3,600 destroyed homes. Every dwelling in the city suffered some degree of damage. All the bridges connecting the island to the mainland were washed away, and the hurricane left approximately 10,000 people in the city homeless and resulted in 8,000 fatalities. Few streets in the city escaped wind damage and all the streets suffered water damage, with much of that destruction caused by the storm surge. The 1900-acre arc-shaped area of destruction encompassed the west, south, and eastern portions of the city, and this area experienced complete demolition of structures and nothing within this zone remained standing after the storm. The northern part of the city was categorized as an area of partial destruction. In the immediate aftermath of the storm, a three-mile-long, 30-foot wall of debris was situated in the middle of the island. To prevent future storms from causing destruction like that of the 1900 hurricane, the city of Galveston hired a team of engineers to design two civil engineering projects for the protection from future storms. First, the engineers recommended and designed a 17-foot high seawall. Funded by a bond referendum, the first three-mile segment of the Galveston seawall was constructed between 1902 and 1904. The construction of the seawall continued for several decades with the last of the total six segments being finished in 1963. Upon completion, the seawall and its entirely stretched for more than 10 miles. And you can see that nice bucolic postcard of, of what it looked like as it became a, a cultural feature of the city. 
The second of the two engineering projects was to raise the city's elevation. The engineers recommended that the city's ground level be raised 17 feet at the seawall and sloped downward at a pitch of one foot for every 1,500 feet to the bay. Before bringing in sand to raise the grade, all the structures in the area had to be raised to the appropriate height on new brick foundation piers or wood pilings. Over 2,100 buildings, including the 2,700-ton St. Patrick's Church, were raised as part of the project. In addition, all the sewer, water, and gas line infrastructure had to be raised. The city paid to move the utilities and for the actual grade raising, each homeowner had to, prior to, the, to each building being raised, the homeowner had to pay to have their own structure or house elevated. Once elevated, sand was pumped underneath the buildings and into the yard and street areas. This entailed getting more than 16, 16 million cubic yards of sand onto the island. To do this, Sand was dredged from Galveston's ship channel and pumped as liquid slurry through pipes into quarter-mile sections of the city that were walled off with dikes. As the water drained away, the sand would then remain. By 1911, the grade of about 500 blocks had been raised, and some, some just by a few inches and others by as much as 11 feet. It's estimated at the time that it cost $16 million to build the seawall and raise the grade. While Galveston received financial help from the county, state, and federal governments, a large portion of the burden had to be carried by the city itself. Human technology and lots of money made it possible for the city of Galveston to remain on such unstable and vulnerable land. The seawall was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1977. In 2001, the seawall and the raising of the island were jointly named a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark by the American Society of Civil Engineers and everyone in Galveston lived happily ever after. So maybe some of the sea level rise adaptations and strategies that we're implementing today may be National Register eligible in 100 years. And some of us actually wish that we could implement the Galveston model and be done with it. But Galveston shows that there is precedent for using extreme measures against storms and flooding. And who knows if that's a right or wrong thing to do in the long run. Now on to North Carolina. Due to a fluke of geology, North Carolina sticks way out into the Atlantic Ocean. As a result, we have really nice beaches, but it also makes us a prime target for hurricanes. This is well illustrated when you look at the tracks of hurricanes since 1900 that have come within 65 nautical miles of Cape Hatteras. Historic materials are very resilient and hold up well to flooding. Traditionally, after hurricanes and floods, people just swept out the mud, sand, and water, slowly dried things out, and kept on trucking. There was not typically a lot of tearing out of historic building fabric and almost no elevation of structures. As tropical cyclones affecting North Carolina usually take one of three tracks, we're subject to both coastal flooding related to storm surge and inland riverine flooding from torrential rains associated with these storms. Our entire state has the potential to experience some type of significant flooding event. When Hurricane Hazel, a Category 4 hurricane, struck the state in 1954, we were still in the traditional response and recovery mode. Despite the widespread catastrophic damage, historic buildings fared pretty well in the recovery. Fast forward 35 years. People had embraced modern materials like sheetrock, paneling, carpet, and, and synthetic siding. Also, development had spread to areas where it should not have gone. When Hurricane Hugo, struck South Carolina in 1989, it resulted in a lot more damage than past storms due in part to the less resilient materials and the increased density of development. While this was somewhat of a wake-up call regarding natural disasters in the country, that call went relatively unheeded. North Carolina remained pretty blissful for the next seven years until the hurricane gods got the seven-year itch and slammed us with Hurricane Fran in September of 1996. North Carolinians, the state emergency management folks, and FEMA realized that some types of a disaster recovery and mitigation effort was necessary. And with this, talk of elevating buildings began in earnest. In early September of 1999, we were hit with Hurricane Dennis that lingered around as a tropical storm, dumping 15 inches of rain on the state. Two weeks later, we were hit by Hurricane Floyd, bringing an additional 19 and a half inches of rain and a 10-foot storm surge. Nearly every river basin in the eastern part of the state reached the 500-year or greater flood levels. The resulting flooding in the eastern part of the state was extremely widespread and lingered for days and in many places several weeks. 
The lower stretches of the Tar River crested 24 feet above flood stage. The storm was the third costliest hurricane in the nation's history at the time, with monetary damage estimated at exceeding $65 or $6.5 billion. Once the state had gotten through the worst of it, the rapid implementation of mitigation measures came to the forefront. Review of proposed FEMA elevations under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act became a time-sensitive full-time job. In order to fast-track elevations and to help mitigate the visual impacts of elevation, we developed designs for period-appropriate foundation treatments to be used on elevated houses and implemented these through a memorandum of agreement. While we also consider the use of fill as a mitigation measure, much of eastern North Carolina is so flat that except on very few properties, the fill itself would have resulted in an adverse effect and would have diverted water onto the adjacent property. The foundation treatments that were developed were based on historic foundation treatments found in eastern North Carolina and consisted of brick piers with either a wooden lattice, brick lattice, or more solid infill with vent holes between the piers. The foundations could either be structural or the treatment could be applied to a solid concrete block perimeter foundation. The infill between the piers was to be set back so that the piers remained visible and the foundation looked to be a traditional pier foundation that had been later infilled. For later houses that had solid perimeter foundations, those could be replicated. A contractor could select from the designs and apply that to the elevated structure. We as the preservation office were happy as we felt we had successfully mitigated an adverse effect. FEMA was happy to have met their Section 106 requirements, and the contractors, many of whom came from out of state, and the homeowners were happy to have the elevations that could be expedited. The mitigation project was implemented in two eastern North Carolina towns, the towns of Bell Haven and Washington Park, both of which were flooded during, during hurricanes Fran and Floyd. And I want to show you these as, as our first case study. In both of these communities, we had identified historic districts that we determined were eligible for listing in the National Register. While the foundation mitigation project looked great on paper, once it was implemented, it turned out to be just an absolute abysmal failure. It resulted in part in the loss of historic integrity to the point that both districts were no longer eligible for listing in the register. And the project failed for several reasons. Traditional foundation treatments really looked ridiculous when the buildings were elevated at higher than about 24 to 36 inches. Second, in undertaking the elevation, some owners had their houses raised higher than required to create storage and garage space below. Uh, third, with different heights and elevations and some property owners actually not opting to elevate, a soft tooth effect was created of different roof heights that resulting in a disruption of the continuity of the streetscape. Now when we were designing the foundation treatments, we did not consider how steps would need to be configured. So constraints on the lot and proximity to the street and sidewalks resulted in some pretty unusual configurations and I'll show you those here in a second. The contractors constructed a solid perimeter foundation that was flush with the exterior face of the sill and applied the pier infill treatment to that resulting in piers that stood outside the plane of the sill. This necessitated the use of sloped water table bricks. The contractors left out, in some instances, the brick fill or lattice infill, opting for parging the concrete block instead. And as some more of the more modern houses where foundations were integral with the wall material, the new foundation was constructed using a completely different material. Now to add insult to injury, in addition to the elevation, many owners opted to undertake unsympathetic rehabilitation works such as window replacement and the application of synthetic siding as well as the construction of additions. Now let's take a look at Bellhaven. The town of Bellhaven is located in northeastern Beaufort County about 30 miles east of the county seat of Washington and is situated at the confluence of Pantego Creek and the Pungo River. The town was settled in the 1880s as a fishing and farming community and by the early 1890s became a center of the county's booming lumber industry. The town gained a reputation in the first decades of the 20th century as a resort community with many visitors arriving in the town by steamship and staying in the hotels that were located downtown. By being a stop on the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway, that greatly enhanced Bellhaven's maritime economy after 1940. The housing stock in Bellhaven consists of small, a small variety of simplified frame versions of nationally popular styles dating from the 1890s through the 1950s. And a majority of these buildings sat on, on simple brick pier foundations that were open underneath. Now, the image you see on the screen now is Bellhaven when it's a beautiful sunny day, and that looks very bucolic. Um, 
This is Bellhaven during Hurricane Florence in 2018. And what we see when, when Bellhaven is flooded, these are typically what you see in the street. So the water can range anywhere from a few inches to, to several feet. Uh, now this is an example of some of the pier foundation or the piers that are applied to that, that uh, perimeter foundation that's at the, at the sill level. So the piers stand to the exterior of the wall plane and you can see those slope water table bricks that look rather ludicrous and, and not historic. And I'll show you what some of these elevations look like. Here's some of them that were applied to some of the Queen Anne style buildings in Bellhaven. Uh, obviously very high and not the most authentic looking things. Uh, here's some on some four square and, and folk Victorian structures. Some of your smaller vernacular and bungalow structures that were elevated as well as some of the kind of miscellaneous Victorian houses also being elevated. Um, here you have some of the minimal, minimal traditional and, and small colonial revival houses from the 40s and 50s. And again, you can see the one image at the bottom uh, where the owner has actually added a garage space below, which really adversely affects the visual quality of that building. And of course, uh, like I mentioned, things like the um, unanticipated peculiar stair configurations that resulted from both the height and the proximity to the public right away. Again, something we didn't anticipate. Uh, these images show kind of the streetscape and you can see um, how you get different heights and elevations where every owner was almost elevating to a different height. And you see some of those images where some of the buildings had not been elevated. And the image on the top left, you can see Typically what the Bellhaven houses were, very low to the ground, um, and then what some of the, the post elevation uh, looks appear to be. And I had mentioned that some of the owners had come in and, and done as part of their elevation project additions, and some of them look like the addition is taking over the house, but that's kind of typically what we see out there. And this is uh, some examples of unsympathetic window replacement, artificial siding, and, and some of the funny things you see in this image at the bottom is the foundation vents are higher than the water level would be, so they're not very effective as water venting systems. The other thing that was interesting that we hadn't anticipated is how to provide handicap accessibility and ADA requirements to these buildings. So here's two buildings where the owner uh, needed to have a ramp to get in, and the ramps uh, almost take over the side yard of, of some of these places. Now some of the, the elevations that we saw could have been successful had they been executed correctly, and here's some that, that did pretty well. To move over to Washington Park, which is also in Beaufort County, uh, Washington Park is situated about 30 miles inland from Bellhaven on the Pamlico River, and it lies just across Jacks Creek from the county seat of Washington. And this primarily residential community consists of colonial revival, bungalow, and minimal traditional style buildings that date from the 1920s to the 1960s. And these typically rest on either pier or solid perimeter foundations. And this is what we got uh, when the elevations were finished in Washington Park. And you can see the brick balustrade and the porch supports on the image on the left are really out of keeping with, with the style of that building. Um, we see in, in these Colonial Revival style houses, the additions that were added are all post uh, flood and elevation. So people took the time while they were putting it up, they added an, an addition onto it. Here you can see some of these smaller Colonial Revival style houses. And again, you see kind of some unusual stair configurations that historically you would have never seen in Washington Park. Uh, the image on the top right illustrates one of those that I mentioned earlier where you have a exterior finish that was integral with the foundation and when that stone veneered house was elevated the new foundation was just done as a parge thing so you have kind of a jarring contrast between the foundation treatment and the uh, siding or, or the exterior treatment for that house. Now as we learned from Bellhaven and Washington Park the devil's in the details so to avoid a repeat of bad foundations we revise those foundation treatments to include language stating that the proposed new foundation shall replicate the appearance of the original brick pier foundation with brick infill or underpinning. 
In order to replicate the appearance of a historic pier and underpin foundation, the new foundation must replicate the look of masonry piers that are flush with the face of the sill and masonry underpinning that is recessed back from the exterior face of the pier one and a half to two inches. Leaving voids or missing bricks in the underpinning that create a lattice effect or diamond shaped vents shall be used to create foundation vents. Painted wood lattice may be used instead of infill in between the piers if desired. So our overall recommendations for foundation treatments are to utilize or replicate historic foundation treatments and materials for buildings that are being elevated. And these foundations have to be very specific as we unfortunately found out. Ideally written specifications and both elevation and plan drawing should be provided to the contractor. And of course, as an owner, you don't wanna put storage or garage spaces between the house. So following the foundation treatment failure of the late 1990s, we had a great opportunity to be proactive in planning for and developing measures to adapt to hurricanes, flooding, climate change, and sea level rise in anticipation of the next storm. Unfortunately, many states at the time were influenced by developers and the real estate community and chose to ignore the evidence for climate change. Some coastal states were not permitted to discuss climate change. They could not undertake planning for or prepare documents relating to adaptive strategies to address climate change and sea level rise. The planning that was permitted could use only climate projections that extended no more than 30 years into the future. And unfortunately, there were even attempts to discredit some of the, the climate scientists at the time who were, who were working on this. Fortunately, subsequent storms and the increased national dialogue on climate change has exposed the fallacy in denying that something is going on. And we're only now beginning to develop long-term strategies to adapt to sea level rise and climate change. Unfortunately, with that, we're trying to make up for 15 or more years of lost time. We're currently using a portion of our Historic Preservation Fund grant money to fund Historic Preservation Commission design guidelines for elevations and disaster recovery in several coastal communities. We'll also be developing general elevation guidelines for the state. And these guidelines will be based on elevation guidance from the National Park Service that's scheduled to come out this fall. And I think the last time I had heard from the Park Service, it's supposed to be mid-November, so we're eagerly anticipating that. We also hope to be receiving some federal disaster recovery money that will also be used in the further development of climate adaptation strategies. Interestingly, some of our local uh, and county governments are getting on board and are developing strategies on the local level. In Orange County, they recently voted on implementing a quarter cent increase in the property tax rate to pay for climate change related projects. As a signatory to the Global Covenant of Mayors, the county is expected to produce a climate action plan, and this is the first county that we've seen in the state to propose and implement such measures. Now in September of 2018, one of our most recent natural disasters, Hurricane Florence, dumped almost 36 inches of rain on eastern North Carolina. The town of New Bern was inundated with a storm surge of around six feet, and neighboring communities in Jones County experienced severe riverine flooding. These areas have now become our laboratory for developing new and refining existing adaptive strategies. So for the past year, we've been reviewing elevation requests from property owners in Newbern. And as you see in the sign here, it all comes together right there in Newbern. In the few years prior to Hurricane Florence, we worked on several successful elevation projects that now form our baseline approach to elevation. Trying to develop guidance for appropriate elevations, we looked at how other communities had handled the elevation of historic structures and buildings, such as those that Louisiana had prepared following Hurricane Katrina. While there were some ideas that we could incorporate into the North Carolina guidance, there were portions of the other state's guidance that we felt were not compatible with our state's architectural styles, building types, historic patterns of development, and the character of our communities. Again, there's not a boilerplate approach to the issue but it's got to be a case-by-case -case evaluation. So what I want to do now is share some of our successful elevation strategies um, as case studies. Ocracoke Island is one of North Carolina's Outer Banks barrier islands with an average height of less than five feet above sea level. Um, the village of Ocracoke is a small historic fishing village, a portion of which is listed in the National Register as a, as a historic district. Uh, the district consists of small houses that are widely spaced on good-sized lots with a dense maritime forest vegetation between them. And as most of you know, uh, Ocracoke was hit by Hurricane Dorian this past September. 
Uh, Dorian was a Category 1 storm when it impacted the island, and despite the low storm intensity rating, it created a seven-foot storm surge from the Pamlico Sound in about two hours' time. And I had been out on Ocracoke here the last few weeks dealing with some disaster recovery, and it's, it's a pretty impressive sight. In the few years prior to Hurricane Dorian, our restoration specialist, Reed Thomas, was involved in the successful elevation of five houses in a store building in the Ocracoke Village Historic District. And most of these during this most recent event received um, state and federal rehabilitation tax credits. So those uh, were actually maintained their historic character and met the secretary's standards while being elevated. Now Dorian, the, I guess the one good thing out of Dorian, it allowed us to evaluate if these pre-storm elevations would be successful during a catastrophic flooding event. And I'm happy to report that all the elevated properties had no or very little water get into the actual buildings. So let's look at uh, the Ogrecoke elevations. While these houses sat nearly on the ground, historic photographs showed that originally they were uh, much more open beneath the building and that windblown sand had accumulated beneath and around the houses. This fact made it easier to justify elevating the buildings as the historic relationship between the building and the ground surface was being restored. In all cases, individual brick pier foundations and in one instance a wood pile foundation were replicated. Except in two cases, the foundations were left open as was traditionally done in the island due to the occasional overwash from storm surge or, or high tides. For two of the buildings that had infill between the foundation piers, the infill consisted of horizontal slats or boards, and historically this was a common treatment on the island of Ocracoke, so um, it may look a little peculiar, but that's something that, that we did see historically on the island. Some of the buildings were raised four feet, and this was mitigated by bringing in up to two feet of fill in some areas. The historically large lot size, the wide spaces between houses, and the thick vegetation between buildings not only mitigated the effect of fill, but it also mitigated the roof line height differences between elevated non and non-elevated buildings. For several of the properties, simple wooden picket fences that copied one seen in historic photographs of the island were used as a visual screening for the foundation. The long linear fence feature also helped to soften the sometimes jarring verticality of the new height of the building. So based on our Ocracoke properties, we recommend the following strategies. First of all, you want to know the history of your building. Sometimes documentary photographs can show the original topography and site features that can be copied as part of your mitigation. Second, you want to copy historic foundation treatments and materials that are seen in your community. In some instances, fill may be a mitigation option. You want to utilize lot size, historic patterns of development, and existing topographic and vegetative features to help mitigate the impacts of elevation and fill. Where appropriate, replicas of historic fencing can also soften the effect of an elevation. Moving on to more urban settings, the elevation of this building in the Washington Historic District is another good model for a successful elevation. This project was also done utilizing the state rehabilitation tax credits. Now the buildings in this part of Washington uh, sit very low to the ground as you can see in the house on the right in the top image. As part of the elevation project, the owners reproduced a brick pier foundation with wood lattice panels between the piers. And given the slight slope of this lot, a very small amount of fill was actually be able to be used without creating any kind of visual impacts. But one of the innovative things that we did on this building concerned the stair treatment. So a very simple stair was used, and this stair is a narrow for most of the run except at the bottom, which you can see the two steps actually widen out. And this creates an optical illusion of a much shorter set of steps. So to help, mid to help with the illusion, the newels begin on the third step and the railings and balustrades run upward from there. And our office, through close coordination between uh, the local building official and the owner, it was determined that the bottom two steps were low enough by code that the railings could actually start on that third step. So it really helped to bring that building down uh, in appearance to the ground. In many of these elevations, a few inches can make a world of difference. So another innovative technique that we used in the Washington project was the treatment of crawl space ductwork. So to keep the house as low as possible and have ductwork that was above the base flood elevation, we used ducts that were wider but shorter. And by using the rectangular ducts instead of the square ducts, 
that actually saved between three and four inches in elevation height. And like I said, every, every inch will count sometimes when you're dealing with historic properties. Another option is the use of ductless mini-split HVAC systems, which can eliminate the need for cross-space duct work entirely. So the takeaways from the Washington project are to work closely with the State Preservation Office and your local building code officials through all stages of a project, as there may be code relief possible through the use of innovative design options. Secondly, you want to use stair designs that are in keeping with the style and character of the house. You want to use innovative stair designs and configurations that lessen the visual impact of those new stairs. Uh, you want to counteract kind of what we were seeing in, in Bellhaven and Washington Park. You want to design crawl space systems so that the height of features such as ductwork are reduced and consider using HVA systems that require no crawl space features at all. That certainly makes your plumbers and your termite inspectors happy as well. The elevation of this house in the Newburn Historic District which backs up to the Noose River was successfully mitigated with fill, terracing, retaining walls and fencing. And for this slide just ignore the modern appearance of the foundation for now. The height of the post elevation roof line was well within the range of building heights on the street, thus not disrupting the rhythm of the houses on the block. Fill was placed on the lot extending from East Front Street and tapering downward towards the rear of the lot, which is, where the, which is the water side. As this is a corner property on a narrow lot, fill was used on only three sides of the building. Low brick retaining walls were constructed on the front, rear, and south sides of the house creating a terraced yard. On the side elevation where no fill was used, a row of small shrubs slightly higher than the retaining wall in the front and rear yards were planted between the house and the sidewalk. These shrubs obscure the lower part of the foundation and help create a long, low, horizontal linear element along this elevation which helps tie the building to the ground and gives the appearance that the building is not as high as it actually is. An appropriate style wooden picket fence was placed on top of the retaining walls and shrubs were planted in the yard. Steps to access the property were recessed within and behind that wall, and so the placement of the walls and fences immediately adjacent to the sidewalk follow a historic placement of these types of features that we see in other areas of the Newburn District. So you're not creating a new landscape feature or a landscape feature that might not have been there historically in the district. One of the issues that many of our local preservation commissions are struggling with are the code required foundation vents. FEMA regulations allow for the use of engineered foundation vents that replicate the appearance of historic foundation vents. And these vents can be designed to operate in such a manner that issues with hydrostatic pressure are addressed. These vents can be used in lieu of the off-the-shelf models. And we recommend that uh, on primary elevations, your foundation vents should look similar to historic foundation vents, where modern foundation vents can actually be used on secondary elevations and areas obscured by features such as, portion, as porches. On this house, which is catty corner from the house that I just showed you, this, the second empire style mansard roof was a major mitigating factor which allowed this house to be successfully elevated. At the ground level, the owner employed the same strategies of fill, terracing, and retaining walls and fencing that were used at the house across the street. In this case, the owner only filled one side, or only filled one of the side yards and be began the fill and a one and a half foot retaining wall in the same plane as the front elevation of the house, allowing the front yard to remain at sidewalk level. Foundation planners were used to mitigate the height on, on the front elevation. So recommendations for elevations relating to these projects are that the strategic placement of fill may be successfully used even in areas where the historic topography is level. Retaining walls and terracing, if they're used, should be kept low and constructed of materials that are traditionally found in your district or your area. Traditional styles of fencing could be used in conjunction with these retaining walls to further obscure elevations. The selective placement of low foundation plantings can help mitigate elevations and obscure new foundations. And you want to place fences, retaining walls, and planning so that they create a long, low, horizontal, or linear element along a building elevation to help visually tie that building to the ground and give it the appearance that the building has not been elevated as high as it actually is. On your primary elevations, you want to design foundation vents to look similar to historic foundation vents, while modern foundation vents can be used on secondary elevations and areas obscured by features such as porches.
The other, another thing that we have done on some of these modern foundation vents is you can actually paint them a brick color or foundation color and that works pretty well in helping these visually disappear into the background of the foundation. Now we find that the elevation techniques that I've just shown you work really well on houses that are being elevated up to three feet. They work pretty well on houses being elevated up to four feet, but once you start going higher than four feet, things really get difficult to mitigate. So even with these strategies, it becomes very difficult to elevate a building above a certain height and maintain its historic character. In the last few years, storms like Florence have resulted in revisions to FEMA flood insurance maps for many communities across the state. And the new base flood elevations coupled with some communities' freeboard heights make mitigating elevation extremely challenging. Since the beginning of this year, we have seen elevation requests for buildings impacted by Hurricane Florence with elevation heights needing to meet base flood elevation or freeboard heights of between 8 and 11 feet. These elevations will serve as a test case for our current mitigation strategies and will hopefully allow us to develop additional solutions to address the desire to elevate and to maintain a building's historic integrity and the National Register status, as well as maintaining the integrity of the historic district that that building lies within. So for this house in Newburn that we reviewed for a local HPC, we provided some guidance to them. Um, they have approved elevating this house five feet project will entail a historic foundation treatment, a picket fence, and appropriate stair designs and some minor filling as mitigation. And while the project looks good on paper, only time will tell if it's been successful. So they haven't started this elevation yet. Now to illustrate the difficulties that we're facing and, and what many of communities are facing throughout the state, I want to show you one last building in Newburn. This spring we reviewed the proposed elevation of this house at the request of the, the Newman Preservation Commission. This house is located at the southwest corner of the National Register listed and locally designated historic districts. Um, it's contributing in both of those. It's a 1950s minimal traditional style building and is the third building that you see when entering the city from the south across the Trent River Bridge. This house was flooded during Hurricane Florence and here's what we had to work with. As you can see from the slide, the topography in the district is essentially flat. The house sits 24 feet from the public street and sidewalk on a narrow urban lot. To its south is an expansive parking lot associated with the former and now historic A&P grocery store resulting in, a in the house having two primary elevations. In close proximity to the north is a large circa 1850 Greek Revival style house and the subject house sits two feet three inches above the existing grade. Currently, Newburn has no freeboard requirement, but in order to be above the base flood elevation, the house will need to be raised to a height of 7 feet 11 inches above existing grade. Approximately 5.5 feet of fill will be placed beneath the house beginning at the rear wall of the house and will extend to the sidewalk edge where it will terminate against a 4 foot retaining wall. From the front wall of the house, the fill will taper from 5.5 feet to 4 feet in height. To retain the fill on both the north and south sides, a stepped retaining wall constructed of rusticated concrete block will extend from the front corner of the house to the sidewalk. These walls will range in height from 6 feet at the house to 4 feet at the sidewalk. The proposed foundation for the house will also be constructed of the same rusticated concrete block. Two sets of concrete steps with an intermediate section of sidewalk will extend from the sidewalk across the filled yard to the porch. In reviewing this project, we felt that the height of the elevation and the placement of the building on a mound of fill will result in an adverse effect to the house. Further, we felt that the addition of fill will change the character of the lot on which the property currently rests and would divert water onto or beneath the adjacent historic residential building. We found that the height, style, configuration, and material of the retaining wall and the new foundation is not congruous with the special character of the historic district. And lastly, that the overall project would also have an adverse visual impact on the character of the historic district itself. Given the limitations of the site and surrounding environment, we believe that the elevation as proposed could not be mitigated in a manner that would allow this building to retain its contributing status within the National Register listed Newburn Historic District. Currently, this house is in the process of being elevated, and you can see from, from this image and some that I'll show you here in a second, you can kind of get the idea of the impact of what this change is, is going to be. So it is quite jarring to um, 
have a small building that sits really high up in the air. So that's that's really a challenge. Um, that's what you'll see from the street level, and it's up there fairly high. So this will come down a little bit once it gets its its fill put beneath it. You can see how challenging some elevations can be and that unpleasant sacrifices may be necessary. If you take the retention of historic character and integrity out of the equation, then of course you could elevate to whatever height and use whatever treatment you desire. But as the preservation office, like I said, we're still trying to come up with uh, design guidance that will allow for the retention of historic character. Now it's time for a pop quiz. I've always wanted to say that. So you'll actually get extra credit if you frame your answer in the form of a question. So the first question is, what United States city was the site of a citywide building elevation flood control project that was implemented due to a 1900 hurricane? And the second question is, name four strategies that can be used to mitigate the impacts of elevating historic buildings. And you can email or text your information to Amber and she had given you her contact information before. In conclusion, as I mentioned previously, a draft of the National Park Service guidance on flooding is hopefully forthcoming in mid-November of this year and that we will be implementing that into our guidance that will hopefully come out early next year. We hope that by then we'll have all the answers, but in the meantime, if you have specific questions regarding uh, elevations or methods for adapting historic buildings to climate change and sea level rise, we'd encourage you to give our office a call. My contact information is on the screen, but any of our restoration specialists and the restoration services branch would be happy to talk to you. So thank you for your attention and get your answers to your questions into Amber.